<coughs> and the I am of who I am has nothing to do with actually how much I have. Has nothing to do with what job title I have. Has nothing to do with how rich I am. Because of my dad's funeral, they didn't talk about how rich he was, or his success, or his achievements, or his jobs. You know we talked about at my dad's funeral? Who he was. Who are you? Are you a kind person? Are you generous? Are you quick to forgive? Or not? In fact, do you realize that every day is a gift to the point that I'm going to actually ask you right now, with the permission of the person sitting next to you, give them a high five, give them a hug, and say, Hi, I love you. Go. Hi, I love you. I love you. of these principles before we get into going to the next level. I want you to know to be thankful. Who is Nick Vujicic? He is a motivational speaker. Ba, 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 ba. Great, wonderful. Ready? Take out my tongue. Pluck out my eyes. Cut off my ears and burn my skin. You can <laughs> never touch my soul. There is not another Nick Vujicic, and there is not another you. You are you, and you are possible. Don't worry about what other people say. Don't worry about what other people have compared to you. You are beautiful just the way you are. And I want you to know that you have a lot of control with the decisions that you make. I'm not saying that all you need is positivity. No, I'm not that person. You know those people that say, well, all you need is just to be positive. I feel like headbutting them in the face. And then say, just be positive. Right? What we got to understand is that there are many people with different religions and philosophies and I understand that. But when I was 12 years old, now that we talked about having an attitude of gratitude, really knowing the truth of your identity and your purpose is next. So the number two thing I want you to write down is find the truth of my value. Find the truth of my value. When I was 12 years old, I was at an airport and a woman looked at me and she said, were you born this way? I said, yes. She said, do you know why? I said, no. She said, would you like to know why? I said, yes. Now, for the record, my parents don't know why I was born this way. Um, my, my doctors don't know why I was born this way. And Lady Gaga don't know why I was born this way either. <laughs> And as I was going through school, I was wondering about these larger questions. Who am I and what am I going to be? And many people said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, well, I can't be a fireman. I can't be a policeman. I can't be, a, you know, all these things because I am Nick Vujicic and I have no arms and legs. It kind of like even defined me. Forget about the fact that I had no arms and legs. My head and my heart were disabled. And some of you have arms and legs, but your head and your heart are disabled. Yes? What would you rather have? A disabled body or a disabled heart? A disabled what? Body. Because there are so many times where in life, sometimes we feel like we have everything we want and everything we need and we still don't feel free. And I want you to be free because some of you actually have been told by your own parents, you are crazy. You're not good enough. 
You're a failure. And I want you to know to get rid of that, to understand the truth of who you are. And sometimes when people say things, it's not always true. And this woman, she said, well, I know why you were born this way. And I'm like, what do you mean? She said, have you heard of reincarnation? I said, no. She said, it's very simple. You're a perfect example of that philosophy. I said, what do you mean? In your previous life, you were a very, very, very bad boy. And now you're being punished. And you are now made without arms or legs. And I'm like, what do you say to a woman who just tells you that? Like, do you say, thank you so much, you changed my life? <laughs> she said, but don't worry. And I'm thinking, what do you mean? There is hope. She says, yeah, in your next life, now that you're a good boy, you're going to come back like a butterfly. And I'm thinking, that sucks. I don't want to be a butterfly. <laughs> you know how many butterflies I've killed in my wheelchair? <laughs> So what we're going to understand is when you find the truth of your value and your purpose, people can say what they want, but in the end, let me tell you when Nick Vujicic is happy. Watch this. It's not about my bank account. Yes, I love my wife and I love my four children with all of my heart. But I wasn't just born on earth to enjoy this place called earth. One of the greatest things that has satisfied my soul is to make a difference. And I want you to know that when you look at the word I am, it is wonderful to be able to shut out the lies with fact. And the fact is, is when you're a 19 year old child like I was, who was doing a double degree in accounting and financial planning, went into stock market investing on options trading at age 16, lost $40,000 in the dot-com bubble back then. Then I went into real estate and made $100,000 in 12 months on my first deal in real estate at age 19. And then when we did all that, we went to South Africa with $28,000 cash and went to an orphanage that needed washers and dryers and diapers and nappies and medical equipment. And we gave them their first soccer ball and some sports equipment and stuff that they could actually enjoy this earth a little bit more. And we gave them their first treat of pizza and Coca-Cola in one year. It was one of the best days of my life. And when you realize that it's not just about you thinking you achieving something or having a miracle, watch this. I wanted arms and legs so bad. Little did I know, I didn't need them. I don't need arms and legs. Look. <laughs> I would be great to have arms and legs. Am I a man of prayer and faith? Yes. Do I have a pair of shoes in my closet in case a miracle comes? Yes. But I'm not waiting for them to be happy. I want you to understand my heart is full. My head is strong. I don't need arms and legs. What I do need is the truth. And the truth has set me free. That I don't need to be you and you don't need to be me. Be the best you you can be. And when you figure that out, you realize, see this table? This whole life is about truth taking you closer to your goals and dreams and lies. Oh, you're ugly. Oh, you'll never achieve anything. Oh, you'll never be happy. Nick, you'll never get married. Even if you got married, how can you even hold your wife's hand? Today, I don't need to hold my wife's hand. I just need to hold her heart. And you don't need arms or legs for that. Oh, how are you going to hold your kids when they're crying? Well, when my children cry, I can't put my arms around them, but they put their arms around me. I want arms and legs, yeah? You want something even better than arms and legs? Here it is. Ready? What a cool day it was at age 24 when I was speaking in front of a crowd. And I saw a little boy with no arms and no legs just like me 
And I'm like, wow. He was only 19 months old. He had a little foot like me. And I'm like, that's incredible. Some of you in Malaysia, you've seen me on your national media with that little girl. They call her now Little Nick. After seeing me, the Malaysian government didn't allow her to go to a mainstream school. And one of her teachers put her outside the classroom because the teacher didn't believe that she should be able to join in on the school uh, curriculum. And after I went to Malaysia, all of a sudden she was accepted and her family felt embraced by the Malaysian government and the education school system. How cool is that? we got to understand that when you don't get a miracle, you can still be a miracle for someone else. When I met that little boy, Daniel, I saw his mom and she cried on my shoulder and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I said, why? She said, Nick, look, there's my son. Now I know that he has a hope, plan and future because of your life. And I said, you know what? When he goes to school, if he ever gets bullied and teased at his school, I'm coming to his school in my wheelchair and I'm going to run them all over. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. That's not the nice thing to say. But I went there and he was getting teased and after a 15 minute speech, no one teased little Daniel after that day. So awesome. So awesome. In fact, I just got a phone call saying, hey, Nick, can you come to his high school, middle school? And I'm like, why? Are they teasing him there too? They said, no, he's like the president of the school and he can't stop talking about you. And so they all want to just meet you. <laughs> you know, when you can make a difference in someone else's life, it kind of becomes worth it. What's your goal? What's your dream? What's your legacy? What's the truth of your value and your purpose and your destiny? When you know all these things, now we can get into the fun things. Everyone say fun things. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you ready? Ask them again, are you ready? All right, everyone take a deep breath in and out and sit up straight in your chair. Here we go. Here is the next four points I want to give you and now I want to help you to achieve your next level of achievement in life. Before we get there, I want you to write down though a heading and say, I am thankful. I want you to write that down on your piece of paper before we get to point three. This is before point three. I want you to write down the three things that you're thankful for. Maybe it's family, maybe it's faith, maybe it's friends. And now I want you to write down three biggest obstacles that's stopping you from achieving your goal and dream. So the first list is going to be one, two, three, the things you're most thankful for. And when you look at that list, Make sure you make calls today. Call your wife, call your daughter, call your son, say, hey, I love you. Make sure that they understand that you are thankful for them. Now with your goals and dreams, when you look at now your obstacles, one, two, three, is it a lack of skill or knowledge? Is it a lack of experience? Is it a lack of money? Is it a lack of training? What do you think is standing in the way between you and your goal? Write them down real quick. And now I'm going to give you the keys to success. After you have an attitude of gratitude and you know the truth of your value and your purpose and your destiny, Four, five, six, seven. Write this down. Sorry. Number three, four, five, six. Write this down. I don't know what I can achieve until I try. 
One of the things I am most thankful for is the fact that my parents allowed me to fail. I'll never forget when I was six or seven years old, there was something on the bookshelf that I wanted to reach and I just couldn't reach it. Mom, can you please help me? You know what she said? No. When we were at the store, at the shopping mall, Dad, Mom, can we have that? You know, they said, no. Get your own money. But I don't have any money. You know what they said? Figure it out. Tell your neighbor, figure it out. Go. <laughs> Tell them with conviction, double volume. Tell them, figure it out. Yeah. That's exactly what my parents said. They said, your brother takes out the rubbish bin and he makes a dollar or two a week. You could do something, figure it out. So I'm like, okay, well then I'm gonna maybe vacuum. So I got the vacuum cleaner and I got it on my shoulder. I was six years old, turned it on with my chin. And I'm I would vacuum the whole house once a week for two dollars a day. I am so thankful my parents didn't give me everything I wanted. Parents, stop giving everything your children want. Sorry, you are not doing them a favor. Make them understand what it means to set goals. Make them understand appreciating what they have. They will never appreciate what they have if you give them everything they want. So when I wanted a $15 toy from the store, guess what that meant for me? I had to work at least eight weeks to save up $15. And then guess what? When I had $15, I then had another thought, well, what if I don't buy it now? And is that for sure what I really, really want? It taught me self-control. It taught me an attitude of gratitude. It taught me patience. It taught me to set a goal. It taught me persistence. Because my parents said no. And one day when I was reaching up for that bookshelf, and my mom said, no, figure it out. You know what I did? When you want something so bad, you figure it out. Yes? How bad do you want it? How bad do you want to achieve your goals and your dreams? You want to know how you know that? Is what you do today. And I looked around and I didn't complain about what I didn't have. Some of us waste time at wishing you had something more. Do you want to know that the billionaires of this world were never focusing on what they didn't have, they focused on what they did have. The people who are most successful aren't the ones who waited for more to come into their life to then do more. It were the people who decided whether more blessings come to me or not, I am going to become, watch this, if you get this, your life will change forever. I will master leverage, leveraging and using everything I have to the best of my ability. Those are the people who are most successful. Not the ones who stand on the sidelines and say, well, I need more training, and I need more people to believe in me, and I need more leads, and I need more opportunity, and I need, but, 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 no! What do you have? If you need more training, if you need more motivation, if you need more inspiration, my question back to you is, how bad do you want it? Because how bad you want it will then change what you do today. Are you with me, New Skin? Yes. Is this too strong for you? No. Is it good? Yes. Say, it's a good pain. It's a good, good pain. It is. It sucks for someone to tell you up here that won't just figure it out. But it's the key. It's the key. Because when I looked around the room, and I grabbed the footstool, the ottoman, and I dragged it with my teeth, and I brought it up and pushed it up against the bookshelf, 
I jumped up like a dolphin at SeaWorld. I jumped up on the ottoman and I used my head and my shoulder to get up and I grabbed what I wanted from the bookshelf with my teeth. And you know what happened? Because my mom said figure it out. When I figured it out, a light bulb went on. Ready? I don't know what I can achieve until I try. I don't know what's possible until I know what's impossible. I'll say it again. I don't know what's possible until I know what's impossible. And you don't know what's probable until you put one foot in front of the other. You don't know what you don't know until you find out what you didn't know. I'm not playing with words here, I'm giving you the facts. As a motivational speaker who is in the top percent of all speakers around the world, saying no to 35,000 invitations, saying no to 99 to 111 invitations weekly that we get. On average, over 100 invitations we got this week, last week, next week. And for a person who travels without arms and legs, 2,500 airplanes, you put all my flights back to back to back to back, I've been up in the air at six and a half months. The new stats is 18 presidents and five governments changing law to allow special needs children to allow them to go to school for the very first time. Talk about making a difference in the world. And all of that without marketing. Without marketing. How? Ask me the question, Nick, how did you become a speaker? Go. I'm glad you asked. So the third one is, I don't know what I can achieve until I try. Fourth, when I fail, try again. Number five, obstacles equals opportunity. And number six, dream big. Do you want me to repeat them or you got it? Tell him, I got it. All right, good. Ready? Now look at me. You will never believe who was the first person to look at me and say, Nick, you should consider being a speaker. It wasn't my mom and it wasn't my dad. In fact, my dad gave me some really good advice. He said, Nick, you were not blessed with arms and legs, but you were blessed with a brain. Use your brain. Start a business and have employees and they can be your hands and feet. Cool advice, right? I was six years old. And he said, Nick, go into accounting and financial planning. At age 16, me and my brother, we were trading my dad's money in the stock market. When I went to university, there is a company in Australia called Dunlop Tires. And in the morning, at 9.15 every morning, I would buy that stock at 73 cents, and by 2.30 in the afternoon, I would sell it for 74 cents. I would make $180 just because I took five minutes of my time working out what Dunlop was doing at that time. 18 years old, making more money than my friends, and also going to school because I could click a button with my little foot. I love my little foot. I've got two toes. Peace, how you doing? <laughs> And when I was at that time going through my life, I never thought that I would be a speaker. No way. I've never even seen a speaker. If we ever saw a speaker in 2002 in Australia, anyone from Australia? A couple. In 2002, if a motivational speaker came to our country, it wasn't because they were Australian, it was because they're actually from America or somewhere else. There was no such thing as a GPS. There was no such thing as YouTube, and there was not even internet when I basically started into my career. Do you understand that? 500 million people 
heard about my story just in the West through YouTube. 800 million people in China know all about my story because of YouTube. 1.6 billion have seen me on TV. Media, 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 but I started at zero. Everyone say zero. zero. <coughs> so guess who it was? It was the janitor at my high school. While he was cleaning the toilets, he looked at me and he said, Nick. I said, yes, Arnold. He said, you are going to be a speaker. I was 17. I was in the student government body as one of the leaders, the prefects. And I said, excuse me? I said, Nick, you're going to be a speaker. <laughs> and I said, you're a crazy old man. I said, what makes you think that? He says, I just know. And I said, what do you mean I'm going to be a speaker? What am I going to speak about? He said, your story. I said, I don't have a story. He says, yes, you do. I said, uh, no, I don't. And I said, bye-bye. And I walked away. The next day, I look at him and he says, hey, be a speaker. And I'm like, no. And I walked away. Next day, he comes up to me. He says, Nick, please, I will organize a speech here at the school. You know we have that club going on here at the public school? You know, they talk about spirituality. You should just talk about your life story. And I'm like, no. He said, please, I'll... what can I do to convince you? I said, dude, leave me alone. <laughs> I walked away. No joke. Over the next days and weeks, he would look at me and I would try to avoid him. I start walking away. He starts running up to me like this. <laughs> After three weeks, he twisted my arm and I said yes. <laughs> and I spoke in front of six students and man, I was so nervous. Anyone afraid of public speaking? Put your hand up. Anyone afraid of public speaking? Okay, put your hand down. Do you know what Google says? Google says that the, the biggest fear in the world is the fear of public speaking. You know what the second biggest fear is? Death. So some people would rather die than actually being up here <laughs> to do what I'm doing. I mean, it's not like right? You know, my palms were sweaty, my knees were shaking. I didn't know what I was going to say. And I started to show it from my heart. And this girl started crying. She's like, <laughs> and I'm like, what's wrong? She says, I don't know. I'm like, why are you crying? She said, I, I don't know, but I was just touched. And I'm thinking, who touched her? <laughs> and then they said at the end, they said, can we have your number? I'm like, why do you want my number? So we can call you again. And I'm thinking, what? They said, yeah, you were really good. I'm like, no, I was horrible. I didn't think much of it. My phone started ringing. Can you speak at this school group? Can you speak at that organization? Can you speak at that church? Yeah, all right, I will. Age 17, 18, 19, I spoke 12 times. And one night I came home from one of my speeches and my mom was waiting for me at 10.30 p.m. And I came home and she looked at me after these people left and she looked down at me and she said, we need to talk. <laughs> and I said, okay. So we went further into the house and I'm sitting down, I'm looking at her walking and she's pacing like this, looking at me. <laughs> I want to know something and I want to know the truth. I'm like, okay. What did I do? I don't know what's going on, but I want to know right now. What are you doing? I said, sorry? She said, I don't know. These strangers, they pick you up. They take you in their car. You go for a couple of hours. And when you come back, you're smiling and they're crying. <laughs> And I said, uh, I'm speaking. She says, what? What do you mean you're speaking? What are you 
you're speaking about? And he said, uh, my story? She says, you have a story? <laughs> I said, I think so. She says, but why are they crying? I said, I don't know. They just touched. <laughs> so I had no idea what to say to my mom. And she said, well, is this a hobby or a job? I said, a job. She said, are they paying you? I said, no. <laughs> she said, well, then it's not a job. She said, stick to what your father told you. You finish your double degrees in accounting and financial planning. You get into the stock market. You get into real estate. And you start your own business. Understand? Yes, ma. She said, when you graduate from university, if after that you want to explore speaking, go for it. But stop wasting your time. I go still in my heart. I felt to speak. And I spoke one more time at a school, 300 students. And it was in front of 300 of them and I was so nervous and within three minutes, half the girls were crying. And one girl was weeping and she put up her hand and she said, I'm so sorry, can I come up there and give you a hug? I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm like, okay, come and give me a hug. She came and she hugged me and she wept on this shoulder and she whispered in my ear, Thank you, thank you, thank you. No one's ever told me that they love me. No one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. And I came home and I'm thinking, you know what? That was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. Accounting sucks. <laughs> and I said, Mom and Dad, Mom and Dad, I know what it would be for the rest of my life. My dad said, good, finish school. We talked about that, right? I said, yes, 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 I understand. But I want to be a speaker. And my mom said, what are you going to speak about? I said, I don't know. What put you down? <laughs> she says, who's going to want to hear you speak? I said, I don't know. What put you down? <laughs> she says, do you know any other speaker? I said, no, I don't. She said, well, how are we going to make money from it? I said, I don't know. Do you know anything about this industry? I said, no. Do you know any other speaker? I said, no. How are you going to market yourself? I said, I don't know. Are they going to pay for you? I said, I don't know. I didn't know. Talk about obstacles. We haven't even talked about the fact that I have no arms and no legs. She said, even if you got an invitation and even if they did pay for you, how are you going to get there? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Ready? Two-step process. When you come to the truth of your value, your purpose, and your destiny, it's when you realize that these lies were dragging you further away from your future, and all these lies take you closer to the edge. And I don't know if you can see this, but I'm on the edge of the table here. At age 10, I actually attempted suicide by trying to drown myself in my bathtub because I believe that I am disabled. I am alone. I am helpless. I am hopeless. I am nothing. And look at what has happened in my life. And I want you to know that beautiful things can come from your broken pieces if you give your broken pieces a chance. New skin, give yourself a chance to run faster and dream bigger beyond your imagination. If a man without arms or legs can dream big and knock down doors and jump over walls, then so can you. You can. You are possible. I am possible. You are possible. But it's only when you realize that these voices and lies, eh, you're not getting them. Eh, you're a failure. You know what you do to those lies? <laughs> those lies, you can talk to the foot because the ears ain't listening. And kick them out and you turn around with those lies and go, nah, 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 nah. I am beautifully made. I am unique. I am fearless. I am possible. I am possible. I want you to know that each step takes effort and sometimes you fall down. But it's not about how many times you fall down. It's how many more times are you going to get back up.
Does anyone know who made the light bulb? Yeah, you can give me an applause if you want that. Thomas Edison, he made the what? Light bulb. Wasn't he a failure? Wasn't he a big, fat failure? Didn't he fail 9,999 times? Yes! How did it feel, Thomas, failing 9,999 times? You know what he said? I never failed 9,999 times. Now I know 9,999 ways he now not to make light bulb. Isn't that true? Failure equals education. Have we written that one down yet? I don't think so. Failure equals education. Ready? So this is how it happened. I didn't know what I didn't know, but I was ready to go find out. You want to know why? Because when you overcome these lies and you turn your back on the lies and you come to the truth, I am possible, I am possible. I don't know anything about marketing and that's a big obstacle, but you know what I'm going to decide today? To figure it out. Because I don't know what I can achieve until I try. When I try and I fail, I will try again. If I fail, failure equals education and my obstacles is no longer a barrier. I gotta perceive my obstacles as opportunities. An opportunity to self-develop. An opportunity to learn about marketing. An opportunity to learn about my industry. Are you with me, New Skin? Yes. So I started from zero. I got the phone book out. Anyone remember when there was no internet and you only had a phone book? You remember that? So I got the big phone book out and I got a massive list of all the schools in the region. And I started calling schools. Hello? I had no idea what I was doing. I was inviting myself to a school. Um, ha, ha, hi. Uh, my name is Nick and, and, and I'm a speaker. And I was wondering if I can come and speak at your school. Ah, uh, no thank you. And bang, she hung up the phone. Was that a failure or success? I invited myself to a school and the school said no. New skin, is it a failure or success? success. Failure. failure. If it was a success, then she would say yes. If I fail, new skin, is it that we are a failure when we fail? No. So what did I do? I tried again. Not the same school, but another school. Hello? Um, hi, my name is Nick. And, and I have uh, no arms or legs. She said, what? <laughs> I said, I'm a speaker and I have no limbs. She said, how are you holding the phone? <laughs> and I'm thinking, why does that even matter? <laughs> you know, she said, I don't believe you. And <laughs> hung up the phone. Was that a failure or success? Failure. failure. Is it okay to fail? Yes. Are you a failure? No. Hi, my name is Nick Vujic and I'm a motivational speaker and I have no arms or legs. Can I come and speak at your school? Uh, let me check with the principal. And I'm like, oh. I'm gonna be a speaker, I'm gonna be a speaker. She comes back here, she says, actually, can I call you back? I wanna talk really in depth to the staff. I said, sure, so I gave her my number and I hang up the phone. I'm thinking, oh man, accounting's so boring. I'm gonna be a speaker so bad. And I'm waiting for her to give me a call back and she gives me a call back and, hello, this is Nick. Um, hi, I spoke in front of the whole staff and we all decided that if you really have no arms and legs and if you actually come to this school, you're probably just gonna scare everybody. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, thanks. And I hung up the phone. Failure or success? Failure, new skin, is it okay to fail? Yes. yes, failure is not a status, it's the process. Failure is the natural process to success. If you try something the first time and you succeed the first time, then it's probably not much of a success. 
Are you with me? So then I called another school, and I called another school, and I called another school, and I called 10 schools, and I called 15 schools, and 19, 23, 29, 33, 38, 43, 48 schools. 52 schools said no. And every time I got a no, I got better and better and better. And on my 53rd phone call, it went like this. Hello, my name is Nick Fortune, I'm a motivational speaker, and I was wondering if I'd come and speak at your school about bullying, self-esteem, dreaming big, and never giving up. <laughs> and she said, okay, and I'm like, Ugh. what do I do now? I'll put you down, I don't know. And she said, um, so, can you, can you come? Like, like, when can you come? I'm like, well, first, I asked the worst question you could ask. I said, can you pay? <laughs> she said, what? Is that for free? I said, sorry, I have some cost. She said, what's your cost? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, 50 bucks? She's like, okay. And I'm like, yeah. I got a job! <laughs> and so she said, so can you come like next week? I said, uh-huh, yeah, sure. She said, um, so, um, uh, will, will you get yourself here? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll get there. So next Tuesday, I said, yeah, great. So I write down her address with my phone. She was really impressed that I was writing an address with my phone. And she was like, thank you so much. And I said, no, thank you. And I hung up the phone. New skin, was that failure or success? Success. I was so happy, man. I got my first job on here. Yeah, I'm going to be a speaker. <laughs> and then... I looked at the map. <laughs> now, no GPS, so the map was in a book. And I get the book, and I'm turning these pages. I'm like, where is this place? <laughs> I'm looking, I'm like, oh no! <laughs> and I calculated a two and a half hour drive. And I'm like, oh no, how am I going to get there? It's Thursday today, the speech is on Tuesday. Maybe if I start walking now, I'll get there on time. <laughs> Maybe I can mail myself there in a post office or something. <laughs> how am I going to get there? Now, I didn't want to ask my parents to take me because they didn't believe in my dream and they had full-time jobs and all that stuff. And so my brother, he was 16 years old and he's watching TV. And he's flicking the channels and I come into the room and I say, hey bro, hey, what's up? Ah, oh, nothing much, I just got something good to tell you. He's like, oh yeah, what's that? I said, a school wants me to speak. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Wait, you want me to take you, huh? I said, please bro, please, you have no idea, no idea. you don't understand. I called 53 schools and I finally got one and it's my first blah, 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 and I really need to get there. He said, calm down, calm down. Where is it? <laughs> and I said, oh, the address is in my room. I wasn't lying. He said, well, when is it? I said, next Tuesday. He said, oh, no, 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 I can't do next Tuesday. I said, why not? He said, I'm busy. I said, you're busy? I said, what are you doing? He said, nothing. <laughs> so I walk away, and I'm the accountant, and I'm thinking, you know what? There's something that you want an opportunity cost, right? When you say something, no to something, then it's really the opportunity cost of what could have happened if you actually didn't go through with it. So then I came back and I said to my bro, hey, I'll pay you 50 bucks. And he said, okay. <laughs> now he's driving, okay? And he's driving, and so I'm in the front seat, right? I'm co-pilot, right? And I've got the book here, right? And he's driving, right? And so he's looking out, and he starts seeing all these houses disappear, and we're going into farmland. <laughs> and he says, where are we going? And I said, 
Why? It doesn't matter. He said, no, seriously, who lives out here? I said, it's a two and a half hour drive. He said, what? A two and a half hour drive? I said, yeah, you shouldn't complain. You're getting paid. <laughs> and he said, he said, but seriously, where are we going? It's like, are you going to speak to the animals? I said, no. He said, how big is the school? And I look at him like, I don't know. He said, what do you mean you don't know? You didn't ask? No. And he starts smiling. He doesn't care. He's getting paid. He said, do you know how long you're speaking for? No. He says, why didn't you ask? I said, I don't know what I'm doing. Brotherly love right there and then. Now I'm freaking out, freaking out. Why didn't I ask him simple questions? <laughs> so I go to the headmaster and said, hi, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. No problem, it's my pleasure. Really nice to be here, thank you so much. Now I just have two questions and she said, okay. I said, so um, uh, how long would you like me to speak for? She said, We'd like you to speak for five minutes. Is that okay? <laughs> I mean, it's like I died. Like everything froze. My heart stopped beating. My brother laughed out loud and he had to walk away. <laughs> I'm now trying to compose myself and it's okay. <sighs> Maybe it's a big crowd. A big crowd for five minutes would be a good experience. So I said, um, okay. Uh, how many people are gonna be there? And she said, oh, we're so excited. We have all of our leaders, 10 of them. And I started hearing those voices in my head. You're an idiot. You're a failure. You're stupid. You're not smart. You're not going to be a speaker. This is crazy. You had to call 53 schools to get one. Yes. And then you had to drive to that school two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back, and pay for gas and fuel, and pay for your brother. It's like you got. I know, like you were giving money away to actually get out of your way to actually go speak in front of 10 people for five minutes. It's not a good business. And I got up on stage and I did my best and I spoke for five minutes and I came off stage and I grabbed her 50 bucks and said thank you. And I gave it to my brother, I said thank you. He was driving home like this. And I said, don't tell mom and dad. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> we get home. And guess who's waiting for me at home? My mom. <laughs> hey, Dad! Yes, mom? How was the speech? <laughs> I said, it was good, mom. <laughs> I went into my room. I closed the door. didn't come out. I cried. I was beating myself up. I was so depressed. I was so bitter. I was still angry. And I decided that night I would never be a speaker. The next morning, 8.30 in the morning, very early for a 19 year old. Did you get that one? My phone rang. No, it's too early. Next time, I'll let it go a second time. I remembered what happened the day before and I got really depressed and really annoyed. Third time, and I'm like, all right, all right. So I pick up the phone and I'm half asleep. Hello? 
Yes, yes, hi, good morning. How can I help you? <laughs> She said, I knew the speaker that just spoke yesterday. I said, yeah. She said, do you talk about bullying? I said, yes. She said, we heard you are awesome. And I said, okay. She said, Nick, just this week, this and this and this happened with our students and we really, really, really need a speaker to come in and speak about bullying. And, and we think that you're the person. And do you live in this zip code? I said, yes. She said, well, then you're just down the street from us, so you're really close. And listen, we'll do anything we can. We'll pay you 150 bucks, and we'll pick you up. We'll look after you. But we have one problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, well, you must, you must be so busy because you're so good. How do we get into your schedule? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Let me check the calendar. <laughs> it's a no joke. I've got my calendar out. It's a little joke. A blank page. A blank page. A blank page. Waited for a little bit. One more blank page. I said, what about next Friday? She said, what? You have an opening? I said, yes. She said, it's a miracle. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. <laughs> I said, I just have two questions. <laughs> I said, uh, how long would you like me to speak for? And how many people would be there? <laughs> Educated. <laughs> I paid the tuition. You know what she said? 20 minutes in front of 500 students. Are you okay with that? And I said, of course. When I spoke at that school, I got another school calling me. I spoke at that school, another school called call me, and then two schools called me, and then three schools called me. Listen, 35,000 invitations, that's no exaggeration. 3,000 stages, 18 presidents, billionaires, CEOs, bankers, orphans, and sex slaves. When you look at success, what is it for you? For me, it was to become a speaker and making a difference. For you, it's possibly to make a lot of money and then give money away. My wife and I, we have four children, but we also sponsor three children in poverty. We are about to buy some land in Mexico and Serbia to start orphanages. When you look at the world today, where do you fit in? Because there are many problems and needs in the world. And I kind of want to be real with you and tell you, number one, go for your dream. Run. Dream big. Because you are possible. But I also want you to understand that the bigger dream, the bigger dream of the people who are noble, the bigger dream of the people who understand that we want less corruption in the world, so in everything that you do and say, you're going to be people of integrity. You're going to be people who understand that just because your father didn't show affectionate love and compassion and communicate to you how much he loved you, now you know what to do different for your son or your daughter. And so what you're going to do is understand that you don't want to just be a parent to your children. You want to be a friend of your children too. Where you can actually take them to an orphanage and show them what poverty is. One of the greatest ways to bring education to your children, your sons and daughters, is to show them the reality of the world in 2018. Show them what an orphan is. Show them what sickness and cancer is. I can't wait to take my children 
to a hospital where they are full of kids with cancer. And when my son is 13 years old, we're going to go in there and we're all going to have some fun and make these children laugh and smile for just a little moment. When we go to orphanages, I'm going to take my son to show him. I'm going to introduce him to 16 year olds who were sold, sold by their own mother for 700 US dollars. There are 30 million slaves in the world. There are 2 billion people in the world surviving on a handful of rice a day. Where do you play in that role? Make a commitment not just to be successful, but make the world a better place. Make the world a better place. I'm going to finish off with a wonderful story, a success story. I know you Asian cultured people, you love the number eight. <laughs> Don't you? Yes. Lucky. Yes. Now, for now, I think you only have seven points, right? So I'm going to give you the number eight. Never give up. Now I want you to put whatever's on your lap down and I want you to look at me. I want to tell you one of the most phenomenal stories. Because many of you say, well Nick, you were born in Australia and Australia is privileged. And Australia is progressed more than my country like Indonesia or other parts, Philippines. Let me tell you a story of success from the slums of Brazil. I don't know if you can see the size of this stage, it's very hard, but if you see the big screen behind me, make that screen like a floor of a house, that's as big as the house was, of this man called Edson Bueno. He, his three siblings, and his parents lived in a house as big as that, made of cardboard, of wood and sheet metal and scraps. They slept on cardboard between the dirt and their back. Edson became a shoe shiner as expected at age four because his brothers were shoe shiners. Uh, his father was a shoe shiner, his grandfather was a shoe shiner, his great 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 grandfather was a shoe shiner. He was going to be a shoe shiner. Started at age four, shining shoes of business people. Four years later, he was eight years old and he ran across the street and bang, a car hit him. He became unconscious and if it wasn't for a doctor who was there at the intersection, who saved his life, he would have died. When he came back into consciousness and they told him a doctor saved your life, you know what he said to himself? I am going to be a doctor. Not one of his family ever went to school. And he said to himself, I will even starve myself to put money aside and buy a uniform to go to school. Of which he did. He bought a uniform, dirty, full of holes, and his mother stitched it up and washed it. He went to school for the first time at age eight and he would start basically kindergarten. He couldn't write, he couldn't read, he couldn't even speak the formal language. He didn't know how to socialize. He was an outcast. He was a poor child. He never saw water come from a faucet out of the wall. He's never seen a shower in his life. He took his first shower at school at age eight. He was last, 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 bullied, last, rejected, last, outcast, always last. Never did he have a friend. And then he worked harder and harder and harder and he became first, first, first. First, 
first, grade nine, 10, 11, 12, first. He became top in the school. He did research. Everyone say research. Yeah. He found out because he wanted it so bad, he went to go find which scholarships are out there for med school. He found them. He applied to all of them. And every time he, won, he got to the uh, interview process and he started telling the scholars and professors his story, they all cried. And at the end of the interview process, they looked at each other and said, you know what, out of everyone that we've ever met that would be interviewing for this scholarship this year, we know you will go the furthest. He got 14 years of school <coughs> in medicine, fully paid for, two specialties, and at age 33, he started his first hospital. Do you know what that takes? Do you know what that takes? We're talking insurance, liability, accounting, practices, doctors, philosophers, the city, the permits, the investors, the entire thing he took at age 33. He started with 10 employees. And I met him when he was 60 on a day of drive in Southern California. He stopped me, really tall man, 60 years old then. He said, Nikki. I said, yes, you don't know me, but I know you. I read your book 14 times. I said, really? He said, yes. I want to bring you to my country. I said, okay. So I gave him my number. Never really went to Brazil for a corporate speaking engagement. At that time, I was charging $25,000 for a speech. When I was telling him, when he asked me, how much is your speech cost? I said, $25,000. He said, what? He said, you need to double it. I said, okay, you'll be the first one to pay. <laughs> and he said, I'll take six. $300,000 contract. It was incredible. Really incredible. The little did I know who he was. And do you know who I spoke to? His employees. Do you want to know why he needed six days of my time? Because he had 46,000 employees. 46,000 employees. He didn't have one hospital, he had 150 hospitals. Not only did he have hospitals and 46,000 employees, get this. You know, like, I don't know, I don't know where, like, your company, uh, your governments and stuff. In Australia, there is no private really health insurance, it's Medicare and stuff. In America, there's private health insurance, okay? And everyone has to have health insurance. In Brazil, he started a private health insurance. Listen, five million Brazilians were the member of his health care company, watch this, who paid every year 1,000 US dollars. If you do the math, it was a five billion dollar a year company. I'll say it again. Five billion dollar company from a four year old shoe shine. Stand to your feet, please. So now you can't use against me the excuse. He lived in a house that big. One of my favorite friends to me, one of the greatest legends ever lived in the motivational speaking industry, my dear friend Les Brown. I had him speak at my event in California for our entrepreneurship seminar in June. And he told all our attendees something 
And I'm going to echo it today because it's so powerful. Before I tell you what he told everyone there, remember the truth of your value, the truth of your purpose, the truth of your destiny, the truth of happiness has nothing to do with money, drugs, sex, alcohol, pornography, fame, fortune, or anything else that this world can ever give you. Title, position, acknowledgement, recognition, empty. When you know with truth and faith, you know that you've been born and created for a greater purpose. And that we all can agree upon this, to make the world a better place. To not judge one another, to love each other equally, to respect one another, to do everything in love and kindness, to be quick to forgive, slow to judge. If you say you have friends, make sure that you are indeed a friend to them. Not just say, how are you? Oh, everything's fine. Nothing's fine sometimes. And sometimes you need a friend. Be the friend for someone else. Let's get real. Everyone say, let's get real. Let's make a difference. Let's show more love. With all of that said and all that foundation.